Hi everyone and welcome back to my top 500 games and we are currently at number 264 and this is Castlevania Dracula X Chronicles on the PSP. Now I remember hearing that you could unlock Symphony of the Night or some other Castlevania game on this game somehow but I was never able to do it. Basically this is one of the non-RPG style platform-ish Castlevania games I suppose. And what I mean by that is that you just have a series of levels that you go through. It's not like a metroidvania and you don't level up and all that. And the reason that I got this game originally is because I had bought something from a shop. It which was a sort of like connector wire thing that would allow me to connect my PSP onto a TV so I could play PSP games on my TV. The problem with that was that the screen was actually very very tiny in the center of the TV screens. It didn't really work properly but I saw it, I sent it back and I ended up getting some store credit and with that stock credit, I just got this game because there wasn't really anything else I wanted. So I just got this game. I did enjoy this game. I did enjoy the precise nature of it, like I suppose Castlevania is known for. I believe this is actually a sort of rehash of one of their earlier games, although I'm not entirely sure. I'm not too familiar with the Castlevania series as a whole, but I do remember it was sort of like a just a PSP version of another game but I'm not entirely sure which one. None not that it really mattered to me because I just knew that I liked the game from what, what I played of it. But I remember it got really hard. I remember I got to one level where there were these knights with these giant spears and if you went even close to them they would launch their spears out at you even if you were on a separate platform. I remember struggling with that. Number 263 is Bugs Bunny Lost in Time. This is a PS1 game that I had and I remember this would have been towards the end of the 90s because you see this game actually became a bit of a meme factory in our house. Well not so much our house but between me and my brother we started to make, I suppose you would call it like a meme, but we made a joke out of the Merlin character because during the introduction of the game and this is all based on Bugs Bunny episodes as well. The intro to the game has this character Merlin and he says how do you do I'm Merlin and I am a sorcerer and then that sort of became a joke between us and so it was something that my dad had picked up on as well that we were saying like my name's Merlin and I am a sorcerer all the time so it became sort of this like family wide joke like I said something what you'd expect to be a meme these days but it was just within our family and it was with Merlin this character of Merlin as for the game itself it's a sort of 3d platform game and you start off in this place called nowhere and you get taught the basic mechanics about like sneaking around so that you don't interrupt people or you don't wake them up or whatever landing on things gently with a helicopter hair thing well not hair i'm thinking of rayman there helicopter ears he uses his ears as a helicopter again like like tails from sonic i don't know how that is meant to work but okay but you also learn about how you collect carrots to regain health and you also have to collect golden carrot and you can exchange those for the time symbols or whatever i don't know what they call them they had a name for them but the main collectible of the game were these clocks that you had to collect because the idea was that you traveled through different time periods so you started in the stone age and each world had a particular looney tunes character as their villain so elmer fudd was the caveman from the stone age and then you had like the pirate world where yosemite sam was the villain and depending on how many of these clocks you collected it unlocked different areas for you and in order to complete the game, you didn't necessarily have to beat bosses or anything, you just had to collect enough clocks before you unlocked the ending, which is, again, rather strange that you don't really have this final boss thing, you just have different levels that you unlock by collecting clocks, and you complete the game by having collected so many clocks. Also what was a bit off about this game was that it was rather skewed with how many clocks you could earn. So for example, you might have a level with seven clocks in it, and they'd all be relatively easy, but if you have a level with one clock in it, it takes like the whole level to get the clock. So the difficulty of gathering these clocks varied based on how many there were through the level and how scattered they were but they all still held that same value also 
one of the things I remember was that my copy of the game didn't run one of the worlds in the first world, in the caveman world. I think it was just a level with one clock in it. But yeah, my copy, it just didn't like that level. It just didn't want to play it. And I also remember that you could unlock special powers that you activated by stepping on these tiles. So Bugs would say something like, Ollie Ollie Axon Free, or open sesame and then like, the door would open or he would bounce up or something like that and i also remember the final world was with marvin the martian so it was set in space and the final level that you unlocked in that world was a puzzle level you basically had a series of puzzles a series of little games you had to complete in order to get the clocks and i really liked that also i believe this may be the first game my brother ever played because he was playing this i remember back when i had the game but he wasn't really playing games before then but he would have been like how old he'd be like four or five years old at this time so yeah he still started playing games around the same age that i did but of course I'm older than he is, so I started playing them earlier in 1992 rather than 1998 or 99 or whatever it was. Number 262 is Streets of Rage 2. This game I did not have on the Omega Drive originally. Again, I played this in other places. First place I actually played this game was in the Charka Center that I used to go to. I mentioned this before. This Charka Center is the same place that I originally played GoldenEye 007 and I originally played Pilot Wing 64. I've mentioned it in those instances. But anyway, Streets of Rage 2 is a obviously a sequel to the original streets of rage which i had played previous to this but this is the more popular of the streets of rage games and also you are granted with four characters in this game as opposed to three which the original had and each of the characters had individual stats there were a few minor details that i remember such as you had max who was this big strong guy but obviously he was slow and then you had skate who was the very fast but again weak the opposite to max basically then you had blaze and axel who i think was sort of like the middle ground in fact i think blaze was the absolute jack of all trades since if memory serves me correctly all of her stats were equal but i maybe be wrong there but yeah it's a it's a beat em up and you have regular attacks and you have jump attacks and all that sort of stuff but you also have this special attack which costs a bit of your health to use but it's extra powerful and also what's good with these streets of rage games is that they have good music as well i have also played this since then on my ps3 because there's a ps3 version available i haven't managed to get all of the trophies on this game because some of them are really hard like there's one where you have to get so many points and it requires you to basically play the game on very hard and i'm not all that good at the game so i really can't do that just even with save states and that's sort of like another rant in and of itself there the whole thing about save states with these ps3 and xbox 360 version of these sega games having save states i i hate the existence of save states i think they ruin games basically and don't give me that all if you don't like it then don't use it but i am not going to go into that right now Number 261 is The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. This is, I imagine, going to be quite a controversial one because I know The Elder Scrolls is a very highly regarded series by many and I am ranking this at number 261. The first time I was introduced to this game, I was talking to somebody over MSN and we were doing like the webcam chat thing and she was playing it. So I was watching someone play this game and I had never heard or seen this game or anything like that before. And what she was saying was, this game is amazing, you can go anywhere you once look at all these things that are happening and i was sort of like thinking to myself oh that's very interesting i later on found that my friend josh had been playing this game when he had his ps3 because he got his ps3 pretty soon after the ps3 came out i believe and i saw him play it and i was rather interested and this game was my very first ps3 game when I got my PS3, I got this game with it. I actually got my PS3, my original PS3, I got it second hand. And then I got this game with it with the collector's edition rather than just the regular edition. Well, the Game of the Year edition, that's what it was called. The Game of the Year edition, where it came with the Shimmering Isles and all that. Now, the one thing that I never really like about these big open world Western RPGs is I'm not a fan of role playing. I'm just not. I just, the whole thing of making a character and choosing their name and choosing their appearance and then 
having to have dialogue trees and shape a story around the character that you make. To me, I feel like all I'm doing is I have a mannequin that's like completely personalityless with nothing going on behind that. I, I kind of feel like, I don't know. I mean, I would rather have a character like Link which is just very generic as it is, but you know, you know who Link is, but I would much rather have that than a character who sort of these bits and pieces that like all screwed onto this face and I don't like this whole thing about you know talking to people and having to think about what to say and trying to be nice to people or nasty to other people I I don't like that stuff I like stats I like leveling up I like puzzles I like gameplay like strategy that's the type of thing I'm into but when I played this game what I did really like was I really liked the exploration in that I really liked how you know you'd find a new place on the map and it would tell you that you found this new place and it would highlight it on the map I really like that what's quite interesting is that my friend Tom or rather Chris his name is Chris but long story short I went thinking he was called Tom for a while so I just called him Tom but he actually was surprised that I didn't know originally that you could see the new areas coming up on the compass. So when I told him that I finally worked it out, he was like, well, you should have known that straight away. It was obvious. And I was wondering why I wasn't finding anywhere, which is also quite strange, because I remember also looking up online at a map of Cyrodiil and seeing all these things all over, uh, just saying, like, all these different places. I'm thinking, why haven't I found any of these places? Number 260 is Shinobi. This is a Master System game that I had on my Master System converter because basically I didn't I never had a Master System. I had a Mega Drive and I later on got a Master System converter which I got one Christmas. But I didn't get this game straight away with the Master System Converter. But this Christmas that I got the Master System Converter, I remember my uncle telling me, well, what's the point of a Master System Converter when you've got a Mega Drive, which is a better machine? And I remember this was my first instance of being surprised that people only value new technology and they don't put value in older technology. Because I was of the mindset that if something allowed me to play more games, then that would just be a good thing. It was a strange discovery, but I'll probably talk about that more with a later entry but I'll just talk about Shinobi for now. Shinobi is one of those very precise ninja based platform games I suppose. I don't know if platform game would be the right term. I mean it is a platform game. You do do the jumping and you do have different ledges and stuff but it's primarily about your enemies aiming your shots with your shuriken and knowing like where to duck and where to jump and all that sort of stuff and being very precise. And unlike Ninja Gaiden it's not about running fast or just being fast in general. It's more based on this idea of just being methodical, being accurate I suppose you could put it more in line with something like a Castlevania game or like I mentioned this same thing with Chrome earlier. The basic idea was that you had to go through all these stages and save all of these hostages. What was quite interesting as well was that this game also had this weird jumping mechanic where you could sort of jump between different layers. You'd have like the top layer and the bottom layer and you could do this weird jump where you press this button or do something and your character Shinobi would do this strangely animated like whoa jump and you would be on this different layer. The big memory I have about this game most of the time is the boss Mandara. Mandara is the third boss in the game and the way that most bosses work is you just you've got the boss and you have to kill them like most bosses would be but Mandara was a nightmare because Mandara was this massive pile of things it was like it looked like this like this Hindu goddess I'm not entirely sure but it kind of had that type of appearance to it but there was like four piles of like five of them or something like that there was just like several different piles and all they did was slowly crawl towards you and you had to destroy all of them but when you hit one it sort of registered a hit and they would spin around but you wouldn't be able to hit it again for that hit to work until after like some time had passed so you spent the whole battle jumping and shooting these shurikens out so you'd have just like these piles of these mandara spinning and you just have to hope that you perfectly timed it all Number 259 is Toy Story 2, Buzz Lightyear to the Rescue. This is a PS1 game and 
the thing is with this game is that it's one of those games where you probably think it wouldn't be that good because you know it's based on a film and like who cares about games based on films and stuff but I think this game actually did a lot better than what you would have thought I actually did enjoy this game and what I did find interesting about it was that even within just the Toy Story landscape and I suppose you know it being Toy Story and you being a toy like a toy character so you've got this small character and you have big obstacles which are represented as what would what we as humans would consider to be very small things that i found very interesting just the way that these platforms were themed and the way that they were put together each level you had a variety of different goals that you had to accomplish in order to collect these pizza planet icons and that was like your main collectible for the game and also as you progress through the game you unlock different powers and you'd find different powers located around the different levels but if you hadn't unlocked that power yet then you wouldn't be able to use it so for example one of them would be this ball that would allow you to travel across dangerous surfaces and there would be one which is like these power boots that allow you to zoom forward and you'd need those power boots in order to be able to complete one of the goals in one of the levels which was like this ray and I also remember the different levels like I remember there's the garden area where you had to climb this tree and there would be like this kite boss at the top at least I think it was a kite I remember there was this construction site level and you had this puzzle that involved mixing different paints together and my brother told me originally that he struggled on that one because when he was too young he didn't understand how mixing paint worked with different colors I never actually completed this game I got to the level which was the one in the building i don't remember what it was called but if you've seen toy story 2 you know the building where woody gets sent to and he's there with jesse and the prospector where he's basically trapped there for a while with all the merchandise that building there i i couldn't get past that point i know that there's a level later which is the airport again a later part of the film but yeah also what's interesting is that I'm sure that I got this game at the same day that the film came out and of course the game featured clips from the film so at the start where you see Big Al take Woody I saw that on this game before seeing it on the film and then we went to see the film. Number 258 is James Pond 2 codename Robocod. I never had this on the Genesis or Mega Drive or whatever, but that is the version that I have played the most thanks to emulation. But I originally had this on the Mega Drive. Uh, sorry, Amiga. I realise that Genesis and Mega Drive is the same thing. I meant to say Amiga. And this is a game, but obviously with it being on the Amiga, this is a game that I played when I was very young and I did play this game quite a lot and it has a few good tunes. I remember the tune Many Cats. Basically, it's a platform game you play this James Pond character. At the time, I just knew this game as Robocod, and I didn't know it was a pun on, you know, Robocod. I didn't know that. In fact, I had an argument with some kids at school saying, it's Robocod, and the other kids were saying, no, it's it's Robocop. I'm thinking, saying, what are you talking about? It's Robocod. Yeah. But it's a platform game and you have this strange ability where you can stretch your body out to grab onto things above you. But of course, if you get hit, or I say of course, not of course, but if you get hit as you're stretching out, you will shrink back down. And so that's the different ways that you can maneuver around the levels. The levels do change their theming and you get this variety of different themes as you go along. Some of them get really like stupidly hard. Like there's a music level where there's all these musical notes scattered around and so they act as very tiny platforms. And you do just get things that just look weird like there's this level where it's based on paint and the whole level is just this sort of yellowy mess also in this game you could get different vehicles and for example if you were in the car you could drive back and forth and run over enemies there was also the airplane which is basically the same but you can fly and then there was the bathtub which is just the airplane apart from it's a bathtub so it's silly i never completed this game i did get to the final boss a few times but i could never beat him the thing is with with James Pond 2 is that there's so many strange things going on with it so many different level themes so many different strange different setups that it's very hard for me to get my thoughts together in such a collective way like I have so many memories of playing this game on the Amiga but it, I'm finding it very hard to describe them because 
there's just so much stuff like i'm just thinking the train level yeah and then i'm thinking oh the level with all the playing cards where the backwards facing cards are fake ones that you fall through but the two things that i do really really feel like i need to mention one is that this game was sponsored by penguin which is in the uk although i've not seen them for a long time it was like this chocolate biscuit thing which you know they were nice but yeah like Chupa Chups was to Zool. This game had penguins in it. And I mean, not just the penguins that you find that you need to save to complete the levels, but also the penguin biscuit bars. They, there were levels that had these penguin biscuits scattered around the level as like obstacles. And the second thing I feel like is important to mention about this game is that there are two different versions of this game. I mean, the game has been released on so many different consoles across so many different systems, but there's a very clear distinct difference between the first, like the original version, and the last version, the new version of these games. The new version of these games don't use penguins, they use elves, and also there's a clearly a more of a Christmas theme with the music, and the level design is completely different. When you look with the earlier versions, like the, the Amiga, the, the Mega Drive versions, all that lot, they have the penguins that you save and it's clearly sponsored by penguin and it has its own level design i think there was probably something to do with the fact that it was sponsored by penguin as to why they had to change it so that they weren't advertising something that they weren't being sponsored by or maybe some new laws to do with games i don't know but that's the story there and i'm going to end this here so thank you all for listening i will see you all next time